Hello. Hello, I'm Vincent. And I'm Andrew. And at Sander Fair and Cheshire Stamp Auctions we get all sorts of interesting uh, collections brought in to us and today we've had a real treat, haven't we? We have. Everybody's familiar with the stamps of Papua New Guinea. Well, became, before it became PNG it was of course Papua itself and New Guinea. Now today we have two very exciting volumes full of interesting and rare bits and pieces so I'm going to hand over to Vincent, who's got the Papua, the famous Lakatoi issues. That's right. And at the end, you can decide which one you think are the best and most interesting stamps. <laughs> well, were you doing uh, something off camera there? I no, not at all. I wouldn't eye. do that to you. It'd be unprofessional. Okay, so what have you got then, Vincent? Well, uh, before the stamps, uh, the, the island of Papua and that whole um, island region was uh, wrapped up with the great game between the Germans and the British and the Germans uh, seized, if you like, uh, Papua and the British sent a couple of gunboats and there were German stamps from uh, the Marshall Islands and all those sorts of places. And the British started using uh, the stamps of Queensland and postmarking them British New Guinea. So before we get to the actual stamps that we all know and love of uh, the British New Guinea and Papua, we were using stamps of Queensland, the Australian state of Queensland, postmarked with BNG and similar postmarks. So I'm just going to put one under the camera now and you can uh, see what I mean. So on this stamp, you can see we've got BNG, British New Guinea. But it's, uh, we've turned it upside down so you can read it properly. It's a stamp from Queensland. And I'll just shift. This is all very high tech camera work. Hollywood eat your heart out. Here's a, a strip of three stamps from Queensland here, each one with this roller cancel BNG, BNG, BNG. And just below that, we've got this postmark tying a Queensland stamp to a piece, Samurai, British New Guinea. So that's what was happening until we get to 1901, where the British came up with, the, uh, with a stamp uh, based on a photograph of a native trading canoe called a Lakatoi. I'm going to just uh, draw the camera back a bit so you can see the whole page. So right, right at the front of the album there, I've got a nice big picture of the basic design. Uh, it's a, a fascinating craft. Nobody really knows the story of the shape of these sails, which uh, may not have been entirely practical but cultural because they, they weren't really copied much around the world. Uh, it's interesting that these, uh, these canoes, and they were big, used to uh, rely on really quite the tail ends of very, uh, very rough winds to project them up and down the coast and they had no form of navigation when they lost sight of the coast other than the feeling of the captain. So no records exist uh, as to how successful and, and unsuccessful these trips were but I suspect they lost a lot of men over the years. Uh, anyway I'll turn to the first page of the collection and here in all its glory and I'll zoom out now is it's just like being in a professional cinema isn't it here is the first page of the lack of toys values all the way up to the shillings and what's great about Papua and Papua New Guinea is that within just two pages of the Stanley Gibbons listing you can find printers of Dullaroo uh, Litho Stamp Printing Branch in Melbourne, Harrison, Cooks from Australia, uh, Ash, uh, all these different printers. Sometimes the printings are uh, occurring in the same issue. Uh, also overprints applied by different printers, different papers, different watermarks uh, and different perforations. It's, it's all there and you can build this tremendous, tremendously interesting, from a stampy point of view, uh, collection 
um, with which takes up literally just this amount of information. Uh, if you had all these stamps, you'd have the most amazing collection. And, and as you can see, as I turn the pages on this album in a moment, the colours uh, and, and the, uh, are, are super. The uh, there are all sorts of varieties that people love to collect on these. Some of them are listed by some Stanley Gibbons. If you want to take it even further, you can get some great specialist handbooks. So I'll just turn a few pages uh, before I let Andy get a word in ed edgeways and see what you think. Isn't that tremendous? The well, Delarue issues are so fine, aren't they? Yeah, compared they to are. the later ones as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. And uh, it is, uh, you know, it wasn't until 1901 when when they started to uh, produce these stamps with British New Guinea in them, and then. Uh, I think 1906 or yeah, 7 1906, became the, yeah. the territory of Papua and they started to overprint these stamps with the word Papua which didn't last, last, uh, last very long but you've got two sizes of overprint which people chase and you get the combinations of the overprints on the different papers oh, fabulous um, and on we go lots of different types of stamps and then very shortly after, according to this page in 07, I think the overprints were in 06, uh, we, we get a, a redrawing of the frame just to show Papua, so no more need to overprint pre-existing stamps. And uh, we, we've got, uh, you know, we've got inverted watermarks mentioned here. Uh, we, we've even got um, some nice plate for inverted watermarks. You start to get the rift in the clouds yeah, varieties, which are always very sought yeah, after. There's a, there's a very nice variety that collectors have chased for many years um, in the, uh, with a frame break in the, the clouds above the, the, the canoe. Uh, it's absolutely tremendous. So I sh they were even used for revenue purposes. You've got a, something here, overprinted stamp duty. And this is all properly arranged and identified. We've got official stamps, perforated OS in the Australian style. And I'll just keep turning because it's so pretty. Then we go on to the monocolour issue which was cheaper to produce, different printing method. And there we go, now we get surcharges. So they didn't have to keep reprinting penny stamps. And you've got the uh, the monogram pieces from uh, uh, I think it's Cook. So I shall keep turning just so you can enjoy what a really colourful, well thought out, presented collection of Papua lacquer toys looks like. That's uh, up to the ten shilling there. You see the stamp duty overprint is now curve to fit in with the vignette which is uh, rather neat and we go on let me just see oh yes then we've got the this is very useful uh, this is the overprinting identified by printer uh, some of them are rare and it's nice to be able to trust the identification you're looking at I think this is uh, a C for a G uh, print uh, it, uh, constant plate floor on the top left corner of the sheet and look at that all the values in the top left corner of the sheet super and I've got a monogram corner pair of officials actually cancelled very unusual and this is not all that's in the collection but it's the main there's the OS official overprints rather than perfins and there's plenty of other bits and pieces with the collection including uh, complete sheets like that isn't that fabulous very scarce as well so go on Andy talk to us about your bit of the collection well thank you Vincent we're going to swap over thank I've you. got something oh you know I like handling yeah here. 
still related to the same area. After the Germans were ousted at the end of the First World War, firstly there were the German colonial stamps employed with the initials GRI on them, which is Latin for George Rex and whatever the other <laughs> letter is, I can't remember. <laughs> well, you you didn't mind. take Latin no, at school, no, Andrew. Yeah. Anyway. This is the companion volume to the one Vincent's shown you of Papua. These are the NWPI overprints. They were employed for about 10 years. And the basic Australian stamps and the watermarks used throughout the period are found with the overprints. Now what's nice about these also is you can find the constant varieties that George V collectors are very keen to find on them. The first overprint settings had the letter P over S just here, and the later ones, the P comes in the space between the I and S, that's the way you tell the two types. Now, they were issued in settings of three different types vertically within a larger setting, and these can be seen shortly. I'm just going to flap some of the pages here. The first one here includes this very scarce inverted watermark of the halfpenny George V head there. Here we have the overprint types. I'm just going to zoom in now on one of the blocks here and the way you tell the three different types on these is by these letter S's here and you may be able to see they're slightly different fonts this one being a bit, a bit more fancy with tails against this one of the ordinary S and then on the final one in the setting they're both fancy S's the Settings of three like this are always very collectible and you can build a very nice collection of all the different values. So we're going to carry on through the album. This block here shows the, the settings of three but within the larger setting of the different types. Different positions. The lower row again is of interest to specialists and you get the different shades on the penny heads there. There's all sorts of little varieties you can get, including broken letters and stops and so on. This one here has got the Weeping Four, which is well known to George V collectors of Australian heads, scarce with the overprint. The surcharges here, some of the scarcer issues on NWPI, but to get them in the, the strip of three, pretty hard to find. On to the kangaroo issues. Beautiful stamps, you get inverted watermarks, you get blue black overprints, which they don't list anymore, but at one time they were listed in Gibbons, but they're so vivid and distinctive, it's uh, surprising to me that they don't. More strips of three, and we come all the way down to the one pound high values there. Beautiful stamps, even high values in the strips of three there. I think they're just stunning and thankfully a lot of these have survived apart from the high values of course so there's always plenty around to study more strips of three there right up to the one pound value there this two shilling has the listed inverted watermark on to the later issues now of the georgia biff heads again they come with the listed australian varieties here you've got the the dot before one there, thinner papers, you've got the die two, and again blocks of the different settings. Uh, official OS perfins there, again all the way to the ten shillings, and blocks, and to the final new colour issues of the George V heads, and there we go, it's remarkably fresh and a pleasure to have for us. So I, the one thing I have to say is I feel we're sat the wrong way around now. Yes. Uh, and and it, it's sort of quite odd. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, I feel very important though. Well, that's the seat of power. Well, indeed. Yeah, but you're already looking short that there's something wrong with that seat, as you know. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that quick walk through very, a pair of very nice collections. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, obviously, 
my side of it was much more attractive and colourful. But if, if you disagree, comments below, please. Thanks a lot. Thank you.